Amen. Thank you, worship choir. <laughs> Thank you, great choir. What an incredible morning of worship through music today. God gave us music to glorify Him, to exalt Him and lift Him up, and to worship Him in that way. And glory, hallelujah. <clears throat> we cannot ever underestimate the importance of those who practice, rehearse, and pray. Not in that order. Pray, rehearse, practice, lead us in worship. Here at Crawford Baptist Church, we are blessed with a wonderful group of people who love singing and love leading us in worship through song. It's very interesting. This morning, probably around 1 o'clock, 12.30, 1 o'clock, I was doing my God time. And no, no need to wait till later in the day. Go ahead and jump on the day. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> but I was in Revelation 4 yesterday, and uh, that chapter took me over an hour to work through. And this morning, early Revelation chapter 5, I was reading and studying and journaling. And uh, Revelation 5 speaks about this scene of the control room of the universe. It speaks about how that the Father and the Lamb and the seven the seven spirits of God, which is referring to the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, is there in heaven, surrounded by the living creatures, the four living creatures and the 24 elders who are falling down worshiping. And they had harps and they had golden bowls full of incense. And this is all a vision. It's a spiritual image that communicates a reality. But they were all singing a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. See, God has a sovereign plan for his universe. And in that seven sealed scroll written on front and back, we have God's plan for this universe, his universe. And there was no one worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. And then to reveal to us what those seal, what that scroll contained. And also in revealing what's on the scroll, this mediator, if you will, will be executing the judgments on that scroll. Of course, John the Apostle was weeping. But then one of the elders spoke and said, but there is one worthy. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Pointing us back to Genesis 49. He's the root of David. Pointing us back to Isaiah 11, 1 and 10. He has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And so they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, the four corners of the earth, the four winds of the earth, every tribe, language, people, and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then another benediction says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne, that's the Father, and to the Lamb, that's Jesus, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. That literally is into the ages, into the ages and the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And so I could not pass up connecting this morning's God time 
with that song. Because it's all connected. From Genesis to Revelation, we even say from Genesis to maps, uh, it's connected in Scripture. And uh, it all fits together beautifully. And having been a Christian now since the eighth grade, it's a long time ago. But continuing to learn more and more day by day of our awesome God and who He is and His plan for us in Christ is an incredible journey that I cannot commend to you enough. There's no greater joy for the Christian than to be able to walk with God faithfully day by day in that God time. And to be with the Lord's people in gather time like this. And like tonight. And then there's group time. Which we had at 845 at our community groups. And we have again group times on Wednesday night for the different ages. And moms in prayer and young adult Bible study. And prayer meeting and Bible study. And RAs, GAs, mission friends, nursery. All these different groups. So we have God time, gather time, group time. We have give time, how we serve the Lord through his church that he's put you in. That's give time. Every member of this church should seek a way to be serving in the strength which the Lord supplies. Every member has a gift to serve. That all have to take place on this property, but we serve the Lord and we build and grow and edify his church. And then there's go time. This is where we go outside of our own environment for like a week, a year is a goal. Whether it be to Las Vegas in late February to in March to our builder's trip in June on our builder's construction trip. Um, Whether it be to Atlanta or New Orleans for some short-term mission trips uh, on Memorial Day weekend and later in the summer for our youth. Um, this summer to experience missions firsthand, involve themselves in serving with church planters, dreaming big next year for perhaps a trip to Paris to work with some former UM students who are serving in Paris as church planters. These are opportunities for go time. But you know, the, the, the overall health of our church, and really any church, is going to be found in families. The families under attack today, we see that we are typically, because of culture, it's not our intention, but because of culture, we are raising a group of feminized boys and masculinized girls. Egalitarianism is much more of a common thread even within the evangelical church today than we would dare to admit. Some of these terms don't make sense right now. They will in upcoming messages, I pray. There's also Google if you need immediate assistance. But I truly believe God desires His churches to be healthy, and God has ordained a structure for that to take place. And that's what we strive here at Crawford Baptist Church to see God implement. It's been a period of time that God is implementing this, I believe, biblically faithful structure. But that's what we're aiming for here in this this church. Last week, we began a brief series before we get back to Genesis chapter 37 and continue our study in what we're going to call the life of Joseph as we finish out the book of Genesis uh, this spring. But the Lord really put on the heart of our pastoral team uh, what we're calling a 2020 vision, focus on the family. Building a foundation for faith and family. And last week we began this series, this mini-series we'll call it, 
by looking at Genesis 2, verses 15 through 25. And last week, we, we learned that it is God who designed and created marriage. We learned last week that it is God who gives and governs our desire for marriage. And then thirdly, we learned from that text that it is God, it is, it is God uh, who has established or designed marriage to be the highest of all earthly priorities. And that message should be available online if you missed it or need to repeat it and review it for further study. I find myself, the older I get, the more I need to repeat and review for further study. So don't feel offended if I say that. I know that's what I have to do as I climb the ladder of chronology, chronological ladder and get older and older. But this morning, we're going to focus on a basic text. It's one of the most elucidating texts on marriage in all of Scripture It's found in the letter of Paul to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5. And so if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. And we're going to read and lay the foundational context for what we're going to deal with this morning. And this morning is not the typical expository message that we normally have. Lord willing, next week we're going to walk through Ephesians 5, uh, especially verses 22 through 33. This morning we will come back at the end to look at verses 15 through 21. My, My aim today is to do exactly what the title of the message that I've entitled, Building a Foundation for faith and family. I want to give you seven foundational truths that we all need to be familiar with. You say, well, Pastor Jay, you know, I'm, I'm, um, my, my daughter asked yesterday, you know, the memory verse that we have due today, right? I'm sure most of you know the memory verse that we memorized this week, all right? Uh, Genesis 2, 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and what? And hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Well, my astute nine-year-old daughter here on the front row, taking notes, which will be graded, (laughs) and my son over there taking notes, that will be graded. Uh, My daughter said, well, you know, why do we need to know that? We're just kids. I said, that's why you need to know this. Because my job as your dad, is to prepare you to be a godly man and for you to get married as soon as possible. (laughs) Now, I don't mean at 12. And there's so much to deconstruct here, I can't do it today or even next week. But our culture has put marriage off later and later and later and later in society today than it has ever been before unless we were in the midst of a world war or famine. I mean, today, if you get married while you're in college, people will think you're absolutely ridiculous, that you're crazy. And yet the Bible says that marriage is a good, he who finds a wife finds a good gift. God has graced you with a good gift. And I know that I can upset a lot of parents and things by being biblical, but you don't have to wait to graduate college to get married. Now I know that's unpopular in culture, and that's why it's unpopular in churches, is because we imbibe more of Dr. Phil than we do Dr. Jesus. And so we need to have a complete reorientation when it comes to building a foundation for faith and family. And this is one message in that attempt from my part to bring Scripture to us as the people of God to help us better understand God's plan for marriage. And so, without further ado, because my time is 
departing from me rapidly. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 15. We'll read verses 15 through 33. I will pray and want to come and give you seven foundations for building a foundation for faith and family. Again, next week we'll begin to exposit verses 22 through 33 in particular. Ephesians 5 verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, if you're here last Sunday night, Brother David Nutzi brought God's Word to us. He dealt, he dealt with these two verses, did a great job. I commend you to go on the website, check out the Sunday evening message. Verse 18. This is our memory verse, by the way, for this week. Ephesians 5, 18 is our memory verse that we need to know by next Sunday. So, parents, work on that with your children this week on the way to school, on the way to practice, on the way to wherever you go. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, we're going to get into this in depth next week. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Now, this should sound familiar from last week. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's our memory verse from last week from Genesis 2.24 that Paul is quoting here. Verse 32, this mystery is profound And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray together and then we'll cover the message this morning. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the beautiful truth of Scripture. Thank you for the beautiful plan that you have in your divine design for marriage for husband and wives and for children and for the training up and the discipline of our children and the uh, discipline and instruction of the Lord. And as these next few Sundays, as we examine these truths, help us, God. Help us, Lord, as men. Help us, Lord, as women to grasp and understand. Help us as husbands and wives and dads and and moms, and grandfathers, and grandmothers, Lord. This is truth that we need. Oh, God, give us a heart, Lord, not as much for the teaching of Dr. Phil as that from which uh, originates in the lips of Dr. Jesus. Help us, God, to be in tune with your word and bring glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Thank you so much. If you'll keep your Bible, we are going to flip a little bit today. It's not the normal walk straight through the passage kind of thing, but we will get to that at the end, Lord willing. I need you to listen and write notes quickly today, all right? Foundation number one is really review from last Sunday, but it's essential because we don't understand this today in our culture at all. And we can trace this back to Genesis 3. This is not just because of radical feminism uh, in the 50s and the sexual revolution of the 60s, okay? This is ancient history to many of you in this room. 
But you can go back and find sources and, 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 and plans and, and things that were put in place uh, based upon non-biblical worldviews that have led us to exactly where we are today. For example, our birth rate needs to be at least 2.1 children per family is statistically to just maintain our population. In America, we're like at 1.9. So we're not even replenishing our own culture and nation. And see, we code language that by an age. When we describe, a, when you hear the words aging population, what that really means is we're not having enough children to carry forth our nation and our culture. We ever wonder why Social Security is in such a situation. When Social Security was initiated back in the day, there were eight workers for every person retiring. Today, that is no longer the case. There are many more retirees drawing from Social Security than there are younger people putting in to Social Security. Radical feminism at its root, seeking to establish egalitarianism, saying there's no difference between males and females. Okay, radical feminism and egalitarians, th- that whole worldview and mindset has, has tried to eliminate women having children, which, is, which has fed the abortion culture over the decades, so that today uh, nearly 61 million children have been aborted and murdered in our nation alone. This is a horrible crime against God and against humanity. And so, you see, these trends all come together to affect us in various ways, politically, economically, socially, familially, and spiritually, for sure. And so, and if I stay on this, all we'll have is introduction. So let me give you, again, point number one today is this, God designed marriage and in Ephesians 5 which we have just read the apostle Paul alluded to the Genesis account of Genesis 2 24 here in Ephesians 5 marriage y'all is God's plan it is God's idea God's plan involves a lifelong monogamous all right that's with one person Heterosexual, that's with a male and female coming together in that relationship. This is God's plan, involves a lifelong monogamous heterosexual relationship. And God's plan also involves different roles for the man and the woman. And we'll talk about those more next week. Jesus himself affirmed this teaching in Matthew chapter 19 verses 3 through 6. In those verses, we won't turn to them for time's sake, but in Matthew 19 verses 3 through 6, I jot them down for further study. Jesus quotes from Genesis 1 27 where the Lord God says that let us create man in our image, in the image of God, he created them male and female. That's Genesis 1, 27. In Genesis 2, 24, you know, he says, Therefore uh, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Jesus quotes both of those uh, verses from Genesis 1, 27 and 2, 24 in Matthew 19, 3 through 6. The Apostle Paul, uh, in many places, but also in Ephesians 5, which we've just read, also speaks of marriage and he drives it back to creation how God created the man and therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh but the apostle Paul not only and I catch this not only um, roots marriage in creation in Ephesians 5 very clearly the apostle Paul roots marriage in redemption Because he says here in verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. You see, when when God thought about the relationship of Jesus Christ, his son, to his redeemed people whom he would call his bride, he said, you know, the, the, the image, the visual image for this will be the marital relationship of a husband 
and a wife. God thinks very highly of marriage. God thinks very highly of marriage. And our understanding of marriage, our view of marriage, does not derive from uh, human desires or from cultural patterns. Our view of marriage derives from God's inspired word. Jesus Christ does not look at marriage as a social convention or simply a piece of paper. Rather, Jesus views marriage as a sacred bond between a man and a woman entered into before God. And furthermore, we believe, since God designed marriage in creation, that marriage is not just for Christians. Marriage is for all of humanity. All of humanity, sociologists will confirm, all of humanity is better off when there are strong marriages uh, around the different cultures in society. It's good for society. It's good for for families because God designed it. It is ultimately, though, for God's glory. So number one, God designed marriage. Jot that down, right, in the back of your Bible, right? Find a spot on the bulletin, although I know it's full today. But, (coughs) excuse me, we need to understand God designed marriage. Foundational truth number two, the fall damaged marriage. The fall damaged marriage. Marriage. If you hold your place in Ephesians 5 and go back to Genesis 3 with me for a moment. Not unfamiliar. We've been preaching through Genesis now for a good while. But in Genesis chapter 3, we're going to see some things. You see, after the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, sin led to the distortions of God's institution of marriage. This is why Paul in Ephesians 5 um, is instructing us. And the reason is because we don't naturally do these things. We do not naturally do what we're called by God to do. Ladies do not naturally want to take their roles, and men do not naturally want to assume their roles. Look at Genesis 3.16. The Lord said to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So uh, the woman will have wrong desires, right? You see that in the text. And the husbands are going to be tempted to dominate their wives. So when you see harsh husbands manipulating or controlling wives, opposing loving leadership, you see the effects of the fall of Adam and Eve into sin. That's what you have. Furthermore, man is going to suffer in his labor. Look at verse 17. And and to Adam, the Lord said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I've commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so you see, man is going to suffer in his labor in providing for his family. Now, ladies are going to bear pain in childbirth. We saw that back in verse 16. I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children, Genesis 3.16. It just hit me this week that oftentimes at our hospitals, we call them the labor and delivery room. Have you ever wondered where that came from? The labor and delivery room. I haven't researched this methodically, but it's just man is going to labor in the field, working to provide for his family, the woman, the wife, will labor in giving birth. And it's all due to human rebellion against God's commands, which are good and right and true. But you see, in Genesis 3.15, hope is provided. Look at Genesis 3.15. The Lord God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed, literally, and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The Messiah, Jesus, is going to crush the serpent, giving new life and restored relationships. Amen. 
And so, number one, God designed marriage. Number two, the fall into sin, it has marred marriage. It has damaged marriage. And this is every marriage. Every marriage. Every future marriage. Every every existing marriage. Every former marriage has been affected by sin due to the fall. Foundational truth number three. You're listening fairly well here. Number three, we affirm the goodness of marriage. That's a good place for an amen. I'm going to say it again and give you a second chance. We affirm the goodness of marriage. Amen. Amen. That's weak, but I'll take it. We affirm the goodness of marriage. You see, despite the fall of of mankind into sin, we have a positive view of marriage. Paul is assuming in Ephesians 5 that many of the Ephesians are married. He does not have a negative view of marriage uh, at all. Instead, he tells them how they are to live as married men and women, husbands and wives, in a way that will honor God. You know, Genesis, back over here in Genesis 2 uh, and verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. And the men said, amen, Amen, all right? It's not good for the man to be alone. Now, if you doubt me, you don't need to be a sociologist, all right? Go look in a single man's apartment. That's all the proof you need is to know it's not good for the man to be alone. To be alone. I remember when I first met my beloved Shulamite woman, Miss Pam, on Friends Day back in 1990 at North Graham Baptist Church, and and we began a a courting relationship. And my 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 fridge consisted of sun drops. Uh, I had lemon meringue pie, chocolate pie, and mold. The little ladies in my church, since I was was single, they helped me out. They baked pies and brought them to Pastor Jay, and I was so happy. That's what I would eat for breakfast. And when I didn't have money to go out and eat, that's what I would eat. I'd eat some lemon meringue pie or some chocolate pie or, you know, or take them to the, to the diner and we'd go eat or whatever. But that, a single man's apartment uh, typically is a, is a tragedy, uh, a, a tragedy. Um, so it's not good for the man to be alone. God said it, and I think human experience solidifies that. Now listen, marriage, we affirm the goodness of marriage. Even the apostle Paul, who was himself more than likely single, Paul honored marriage in 1 Corinthians 7. And if you're 18 or older, I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 7 without parental help. If under, you can study it with parents. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul said there are false teachers who are forbidding marriage and the eating of certain foods which God has created to be good. He called this false teaching the teaching of demons, and that is strong language. When you say that what someone is teaching in the church uh, is, is the teaching of demons, that is pretty harsh. Well, uh, you know, but what Paul was doing, he's emphasizing the goodness of marriage and the goodness of eating food. Amen. I, for one, am very grateful that it is okay and good and godly to get married and to eat delicious food. Amen. And we can, it's not just Baptists, it should be all Christians known for that. So marriage is not to be forbidden. It is a gift from God. The Bible has a very positive view of marriage. In fact, the Bible begins with a wedding in Genesis 2, and it ends with a wedding in in Revelation 21. Amen. The Bible begins and ends with a marriage. So that brings the question, why is there so much negativity about marriage today? Why do we teach our sons, son, I want you to go and enjoy life and suck all the gusto and happiness and joy out of it that you can. And then 
when you meet that girl that you think might be the one, you tell her, I have fully enjoyed my life. I have sucked all the joy and happiness I can get out of it, so now I'm going to marry you and die. (laughs) Now, listen, there is no parent shouldn't say that. There aren't many parents who would quite put it that way. But that is what our culture is teaching our boys and girls all the time. There was a study done. It's, it's, this is reported, by the way, in this book, The Meaning of Marriage by Dr. Timothy Keller. It's a great book on marriage. The Meaning of Marriage by Dr. Timothy Keller. Um, And in this book, on page 26, Dr. Keller said there was a University of Virginia study. Um, Less than one-third of high school senior girls and only slightly more than one-third of high school senior boys seem to believe that marriage is more beneficial to individuals than the alternatives. That's an alarming quotation. So why the negativity about marriage today? Well, one reason I think is that we um, greatly underestimate the goodness of healthy marriages, largely because we've never seen one. You know, some people think that marriage is boring, Chris Rock, some of you may know that name. Chris Rock asks the question, do you want to be single and lonely or married and bored? That's also quoted in Dr. Keller's book here on page 22. Because of this view, many people aim for something in the middle. It's called sexual cohabitation. You cohabitate, live together with someone that you are not married to. Some people think marriage is boring today, so we have a low position of marriage. Some people think marriage is too risky, so they decide to live together before they actually tie the knot, as it used to be said. It's not much knot tying in Alabama anymore since August. But they decide to live together for a while to see if it'll really work out or not. The surprising reality is that after they test drive the car and finally get married, the divorce rate among those who cohabitate is actually higher than those who do not. Number three, some people think marriage is too distracting. It's going to get in the way of my career. And man, being this and being that and being out in the world and serving these people and these men and these women and doing this. This is what it's really all about. This is what's going to make me real woman. It's what's going to make me real man. And God says, no, the home is to be central. This message is alien to us today. It's a foreign language to us today. But many downplay marriage because they think marriage is too distracting. It will interfere with my career opportunities when God is already calling us to the most enduring, godly career opportunities there could ever be. Education is important. Please hear me, all young people, future law school people. We got I know at least two of them in this room right now. Education is very important, but my marriage is way more important. And so is that truth for you. There is no higher earthly relationship, covered it last Sunday, than that of the marriage covenant relationship. If school needs to be put on hold for a semester to work out things in the home, to get finances stabilized, to get a better control and a godly atmosphere with my family, my wife, my children, put school on hold. Sorry, Miss Charity. It's that important. There will be a time. If it's God's will for you, there will be a time for that. Some think that marriage is too financially draining. However, this seems also to be faulty information. 
There's a study called The Surprising Economic Benefits of Marriage revealed that individuals who were continually married had a 75% more wealth at retirement than those who never married or divorced and did not remarry. It's also in the Tim Keller book. Some think marriage is just too unnecessary. We've heard people say, well, I don't need a piece of paper to tell you that I love you. (laughs) Well, the problem is they don't understand that marriage is a covenant. Sometimes that's code language for, you know, I really don't love you enough to get married and be solely devoted to you. At Crawford Baptist Church, based upon Holy Scripture, we affirm the goodness of marriage. Amen? God designed marriage. Sin has damaged marriage. The fall has damaged marriage, all marriages. But we affirm the goodness of marriage. Number four, we affirm the covenantal nature of marriage. We affirm the covenantal nature of marriage. Now, the Apostle Paul quotes from Genesis saying that the man is to hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So these words in Genesis 2 and 24, right here, black ink on white paper, they teach us that marriage is a sacred covenant as both as we uh, shall live, as long as we both shall live. Just said that a few times last Sunday after the morning message. We said it uh, uh, the Saturday before that. I said it with Kenneth and Carly up here. I said that with Dalton and Brianna in December. I said that uh, that's a part of the wedding covenant ceremony, as long as we both shall live. What God has put together, let not man pull apart or pull asunder. As long as we shall both live, that means despite the storms and the hardships, that is a covenant commitment. Marriage is a covenant commitment. The covenant nature of marriage is deepened in Ephesians. For Paul says there in verse 32, again he says in chapter 5 verse 32, this mystery is profound and I'm saying that refers to Christ and the church. So marriage is patterned. Marriage is patterned after Christ's covenant commitment to his church. Christ is the bridegroom who is going to come for for his bride. Amen. There's our hope. Jesus loves his bride. Jesus is committed to his bride. Jesus poured out his blood for his bride. Jesus is establishing uh, a new covenant with his bride. There is an unbreakable union between Jesus and his church. This is how it is. Listen, your wedding day is the most important day of your life next to the day when you become a Christian. And there are two important questions. Number one, who is my God? And number two, who is my spouse? And there are three big primary views of marriage. I want to touch them quickly. Some view marriage as sacramental. That might pop up there. The sacramental view. This is the Roman Catholic Church view. The official Roman Catholic Church view. That marriage is sacramental. That marriage is actually one of the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. And that grace is being dispensed simply by walking through the rite of marriage. The sacrament of marriage. You are supernaturally instilled with grace. So so there's a view called the sacramental view. The Bible does not affirm that view. Number two is the consumer-centered view. The consumer-centered view. This is very prominent. This is a cultural view. It does not take Scripture authoritatively. It, 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 is, it flies in the face of the sufficiency of Scripture, the Word of God. Marriage, in this view, is about the consumer. It's not about us. It's about me. And if you don't meet my sexual needs, if you don't give me the money that I believe I rightly 
ought to have in, out of this relationship, then I'm free to hit the highway. There is not any obligation to stay in that relationship when things get hard because it's all about you and your happiness. This view minimizes marriage. It also opens the door for marital infidelity and for a variety of marital arrangements that are forbidden and condemned in Scripture. And if you want more information from this point, God, Marriage, and Family, mentioned it last week, Rebuilding the Biblical Foundation, second edition, Andreas Kostenberger with David W. Jones. Highly recommend Timothy Keller, Dr. Keller, and Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. These are books. Hey, if we, listen, if if you're going to, to learn, right, you got to turn. You got to read the Bible first and foremost, but they're great resources, church, to help us learn what is going on based upon Scripture and in culture. And I'm going to tell you, Satan does not relent in his attacks upon us. And right now he's making big gains through our culture. This lack of serious commitment to marriage reminds me of NCAA signing day. And we have athletes put the hat on, sign the paper, commit to the school, and then they decommit. Do you know, do you know that some have even had tattoos? Okay. Some have even had tattoos of that original team, and then they decided to decommit, so now they're left with a tattoo of their ex wife. Does that sound familiar? And they got it. Marriage is not the sacramental view. Marriage is not the consumer-centered view. We believe, biblically speaking, that marriage is the, and number three, the covenantal view. The covenantal view. John Stott, evangelical scholar, right on most things, I guess, but John Stott says it well. Marriage is an exclusive heterosexual covenant between one man and one woman, ordained and sealed by God, preceded by the leaving of parents, consummated in sexual union, issuing in a permanent, mutually supportive partnership, and normally crowned with the gift of children. John Stott. Dr. Timothy Keller adds, in a covenant, the good of the relationship takes precedence over the immediate needs of the individual. I remember an old line from a Star Trek movie called The Wrath of Khan. Anybody remember that? Mr. Spock said that the needs of the many, what? Outweigh the needs of the few. So in that Star Trek movie, he sacrificed his life to save the crew. It reminded me of Dr. Timothy Keller's quote, in a covenant, the good of the relationship takes precedence over the immediate needs of the individual. Ephesians 5, 25, we're getting to it next Sunday. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and what? Gave himself up for her. What does that mean? On the cross, he died for his bride. So there's a vertical and a horizontal dimension. You know, Proverbs speaks of the forbidden one who commits adultery, who, listen to this, forsakes the companion of her youth, that's the horizontal, right, and forgets the covenant of her God, that's the vertical dimension, that's from uh, Proverbs 2.17 and Malachi 2.14. But what does this covenant mean? I've got to speed it up, I know. What does this covenant mean? Just a couple of things. We're almost done. What does this covenant mean? This comes from Dr. Andreas Kostenberger and Dr. Jones' book, God, Marriage, and Family, all right? These uh, five or so things. Number one, covenant means permanence. Divorce is not permitted except in certain biblically prescribed 
circumstances. The covenant is to be permanent. Number two, covenant means sacredness. It's not merely a civil union, which is what we've gone to in Alabama. You don't need a priest or a pastor or a clergyman. You just fill out a form, get it notarized, drop it off at probate court, and you are married. I wonder how God feels about that. But covenant means sacredness. It's not merely a civil union. It's a relationship before and under God. Covenant number three means intimacy. It involves leaving parents and cleaving, uh, holding fast to one another as husband and wife. Covenant means mutuality. Both spouses are to seek the good of the other. That's mutuality. And then number five, covenant means exclusiveness. You see, Jesus addressed, excuse me, Jesus addressed sexual immorality, including lustful thoughts, with seriousness. I am exclusively for Pam. Pam is exclusively for me. If you, if, if anything takes place uh, that's inappropriate, that is adultery, which is number seven in the Ten Commandments. And so uh, we affirm the covenantal nature of marriage. That's a huge truth we need to understand today. Quickly, the last three, and I'm done. We affirm the goodness of singleness. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Jay, I'm single. I've been single all my life. Um, I'm not getting married. Listen, it's worthy of a whole sermon. It really is. We don't have time today. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35 speaks about advantages of being single as you serve Christ. But you do need to understand that the gift of singleness that the Apostle Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 7, that gift of singleness is not simply once you complete college, going for two years overseas, putting marriage off, and then going two years overseas, serving as a missionary, and then coming back and going to seminary and getting married. Get married and go overseas. That would be the biblical mandate, I think. Again, my goal for Daniel Paul over here and Mary Grace, who are, I think, still taking notes. Now, she's quit. She told me she quit. Uh, All right. No ice cream for you tonight. All right. Um, It's part of the drill. You made me lose my train of thought. Um, Obey, obey immediately and obey with the right attitude, Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. We'll get to that on the 26th of January. Um, we, we need to affirm the goodness of singleness. But again, singleness is not just a temporary delay. No, if God gives you that desire for marriage... And under the headship of your father, pursue that. And we'll talk more about that down the road. But the reference is to 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35. Number six, quickly, Christ is ultimate, not marriage. Christ is ultimate, not marriage. Though marriages should be valued, protected, and nurtured, and cared for, they are not an end in themselves. Jesus mentioned the apparent fleeting nature of marriage in Mark twenty two thirty, where in the resurrection they will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Listen, we do not become angels. I love that great Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life, but, but human beings aren't like Clarence who earns their wings. We don't get wings. We are glorified human beings in resurrection bodies. Amen? You can't say amen, say ouch. All right, don't teach your children you're going to become an angel one. They're not an angel now. They won't be an angel then. They're higher than that. They're human beings. Dr. John Piper said it this way in the momentary marriage, and I didn't bring that one up here. Couldn't care any more than I did. But Dr. John Piper in his great book, This Momentary Marriage, said this, We will be recognizable in heaven and I think have relationships, but it seems that the institution of marriage is fleeting. The shadow of covenant keeping between husband and wife gives way to the reality of covenant keeping between Christ and his glorified church. And Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians, the great salvation plan is for Jesus Christ to unite all things in him. And then number seven, 
we depend, we must depend on the Holy Spirit for faithful and fulfilling marriages. We must depend upon the Holy Spirit for faithful and fulfilling marriages. This is point number seven. I I don't think we should ever teach Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 apart from Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. There are a lot of reasons I can give you for that. I don't have time. But I hope you understand the strategic nature of this message. And it's worthy of our consideration this morning. Our key verse here can be Ephesians 5.18. It's our memory verse. Boys and girls, make sure your parents help you learn this this week. We've got all week to learn it. Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, And do not. Be drunk with wine. Do you see it? Do not get drunk with wine. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Ask your parents to define that word for you. But be filled with the Spirit. That's where we stop. Just Ephesians 5.18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. You see, these verses are intended to flow from chapter 1 right through chapter 6. And the key to that fulfilling and faithful marriage for the husband and the wife and the parents, as we're going to see in upcoming messages, is that we be filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, please don't hear me wrongly. There are some good families, and they're not Christians. If you're here today and you're one of them, I'm not slamming you as a bad parent, husband, wife, father, mother. I'm not. But I am saying that you are created by a Creator God who is worthy of your devotion, your love, your service. And when we yield to Him, and we are regenerated and born again into the family of God, we are then filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And as we sang in that beautiful song Brother Kenneth introduced us to today, it's not me speaking, but it's Christ through me. Same thought from Galatians 2.20, and here's in Ephesians 5.18. And so we must depend upon the Holy Spirit for faithful and fulfilling marriages and without him filling and controlling and strengthening us men you will never cease to be harsh towards your wife and wives you will never cease to be manipulating and controlling and trying to dominate and domineer the leadership and the headship of your husband apart from the filling of the Holy Spirit These are seven foundational pillars or truths that enable us to build a foundation for faith and family. So I need the Holy Spirit. Yes, you do. How do I get Him? Well, you hear the gospel, and the gospel is news. It's a message. The gospel is what God has done in and through the person of Jesus Christ, doing for us what we could never, ever do for ourselves. As Jesus Christ was born of the virgin, he lived a sinless life. He died on a rugged Roman cross in our place, taking the penalty for our sin, drinking every drop of the holy wrath of God that I and you rightly deserve. And he says, if you will repent, turn from your sins and believe in me, You will be saved. And when you do that, you are born again. You see, in this morning, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit of God will awaken some of you to your need for Christ. And then in the act of conversion, you will turn from your sin and place your faith in Jesus. Because, you see, the gospel is good news. It's the greatest news. And I hope you never tire of me saying it here. I can't. It's my calling. It's your calling to know this definition and to proclaim this definition and to live your life on the basis of the truths of this definition. 
But the gospel is the good news that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people, 7.7 billion of them today on planet earth. And he, 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 what did he do? The, 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 the gospel is the good news that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people and he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear his wrath against our sin on the cross. And to show his power over sin by resurrecting Jesus from the dead so that everyone who turns from their sin, that's repentance, and believes in Christ will be reconciled to God forever. That's the good news of the gospel. And this morning I want to pray for you. If you're here and you're lost and undone in your sin, there's hope. Today you're here and you say, Pastor Jay, I'm a Christian, but man, I'm I'm having it rough in my marriage. My wife and I aren't even talking right now. She despises to look at me. I despise to look at her. My kids are getting angrier and angrier at me because of how I treat my wife or my wife is treating me or, or I'm, we're treating them. There's no sin too big for Jesus to wash away. I love the Paul Washer quote that I saw this week. That for those who are truly justified, that spirit-driven process of sanctification is going to happen in your life. There will be godly change. Now, it's slow. But there's evidences of godly change in your life, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your workforce, in all that you do. And there's hope in Jesus today. Would you pray with me? Let's bow together.